Want to make a podcast? Spotify's got a platform that lets you make one super easily, then distribute it everywhere and earn money, all in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters, and here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer, so no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. Then you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are also available on Spotify. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's totally free with no catch. Ever since we discovered Spotify for Podcasters, we have had so much fun trying out all of the features like Q&As and polls that let us be really creative and engage with our audience. I highly recommend you give it a try. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to www.spotify.com slash podcasters to get started. We are thrilled to have on the show today, Lady Anne Glenn Connor, the author of Whatever Next, Lessons from an Unexpected Life, which is out in the U.S. on February 21st and is already out in the U.K. So I love this. In her 80s, Lady Anne forged a new career path, becoming an author. And her last memoir, 2019's Lady in Waiting, which I'm sure many of you have read, was a smash hit. It sold over 600,000 copies worldwide, was a Sunday Times bestseller for 37 weeks, and a New York Times bestseller, which is no small feat on any of those points. So Lady in Waiting dove deep into her role as, you guessed it, a lady in waiting for Princess Margaret, which we will certainly talk about today. But whatever next takes us deeper into Lady Anne's own life, which is a beautiful and full one. This is Lady Anne's fourth book, in addition to her two memoirs. She's also written two acclaimed novels, Murder on Mystique and Haunting at Holcomb. Welcome to the show. We're so happy to have you here. Well, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be with you. So the subtitle for Whatever Next is Lessons from an Unexpected Life. What would you say has been the most unexpected part of your life? Well, I suppose in a way becoming an author. Because I didn't start uh, until I was 87. Somebody, I sat next to a young publisher. And I've always told stories. And he said, what about writing a book? And I said, well, I'm 87. I don't know whether I can. You know, I can't type or anything. So he said, no, that doesn't matter. Uh, you know, sit uh, comfortably somewhere and just talk into a tape. And that's exactly what I did. And um, I've got very good recall, I realised. Um, anyway, it all just came flooding out. Somebody said, oh, um, did you get writer's block? And I said, no, no, I got writer's diarrhoea. I mean, I couldn't <laughs> stop it. <laughs> and um, and it worked rather well because I think that uh, doing it that way is very much my voice, and that's what people like, you know. And when I started to talk about, I realised I had had a very interesting life, you know, being brought up in one of the big stately homes here, Holcomb, um, a very aristocratic life, and then of course being asked to be a maid of honour at the Queen's coronation. I was one of the six girls who carried her train. Uh -huh. um, and then, of course, um, marrying Colin and Mustique and being um, Princess Margaret's Lady in Waiting. Well, we're going to talk about every single one of those things that you just queued up for us as we go throughout this chat. But let's start with the fact, I think that you know, you've played a supporting role most of your life to your husband. And then as lady in waiting to Princess Margaret from 1971 to her death in 2002. But now you're out front and center as you deserve to be with your newfound career as an author, which as we said a moment ago, you launched in your 80s. So it truly is never too late to reinvent yourself. And I appreciate this book because I got to learn so much more about you. So how does it feel to be, if you will, stepping out of the shadows as you write about in the book? Well, it's been absolutely extraordinary. I've always played, uh, um, you know, I was um, in England. You can't inherit things if you're born a girl. 
And so my parents were very disappointed in me being, being one, not being a boy. So from a very early age, I, I was sort of took a back seat. And then, of course, um, with Princess Margaret being lady in waiting, I mean, that's your job, you know, walking behind her. One expects not to be noticed. Um, and of course, my husband was, uh, you know, an impresario. He was bigger than life. And uh, if he was in a room, one was completely invisible. So um, it is extraordinary at my late age to suddenly, uh, you know, to come up with a bang, really, mm -hmm. um, and to have a lot of attention and having, uh, I'm having a fascinating time. Well, you are probably in your 90s now. And right in the book, like you just said, that you're having the best time of your life. What would you tell your younger self? Well, I think that uh, in a way I had to go through my life in order for it to be a success now. I mean, um, some of it was quite difficult. It was interesting, but I wouldn't have had a story unless I'd lived that life. So looking back, uh, I probably would have said to, to, to my younger self, just wait, Anne, just wait. and uh, Your time will come. Mm. Well, you mentioned this a moment ago, before you were Princess Margaret's lady-in-waiting, and even before you were married, you were a maid of honor at Her Late Majesty's coronation in 1953, which in the book you call one of the most exciting days of your life. Can you tell us some of your memories of that day? Well, I mean, it was extraordinary. I was actually in America because uh, my mother started a ceramic business at Holcomb, and uh, I was a sort of traveling salesman. And I went to America with my samples, uh, and I went everywhere on a Greyhound bus, um, and I hadn't had a great success with selling it. Anyway, I was back in New York uh, with, with a friend, and I remember it was a breakfast time, and the, the maid came in with a, a telegram. And in those days, I mean, telegrams, generally terrible ones that somebody died or uh, sort of disaster. So anyway, I gingerly opened it, and to my amazement in it, my mother had sent it and said, come home, Anne. Uh, the Queen has asked you to be a maid of honour at her coronation. Mm. Uh, so everybody was thrilled. And I got into the newspapers in New York. And because of that, I sold a great many uh, pieces of pottery. So I was delighted about that. And then I remember arriving back on the Queen Mary and my mother met me. And then it was extraordinary. I mean, there were rehearsals. The, you know, one was photographed. One was, in a way, one was, in those days, there wasn't a girl bands, but it was rather like being in a girl band. I mean, we were all photographed, we all, um, you know, we all did different things. And it, it was amazing. Anyway, um, we only did one uh, rehearsal with the Queen, um, the, the Duchess of Norfolk, the Duke of Norfolk, actually masterminded the coronation. He'd actually... Uh, in fact, people rather forget, he had also done the coronation just before the war of the Queen's father, because after the Duke of Windsor abdicated, um, he became king. And so they, they knew what to do. And the Queen, of course, had been at her father's coronation and had taken in, I think, a lot. And that's possibly why, I mean, she was incredibly calm at the coronation. And um, we had those beautiful dresses because um, being war, there would be coupons, and none of us had, had any sort of dresses or anything much. Um, and suddenly, these lovely dresses, Norman Hartnell designed the Queen's dress for the coronation and our dresses. And um, it, they were beautifully embroidered down the front and at the back. And um, then four of us, on the morning of the coronation, went to Westminster Abbey to await her. The two grandest uh, maids of honour went in a coach behind her. And it was pouring with rain. It was very, very dark. And we were waiting there. And suddenly, we could hear her coming. We could hear this whole roar of people. And round the corner came this golden coach. It was like a sort of Disney film. And it stopped in front of us. And two pages opened the door. And we saw her. I suppose we were the first people to have seen her in her beautiful dress. It was all embroidered with the uh, flowers of the Great Britain and uh, the Commonwealth. And uh, uh, of course, you know, she, she was so young and so beautiful, lovely skin and eyes and this wonderful smile she had. And then we got her, helped her out of the coach. She didn't say anything to us that 
at that moment. And we then got her into the Abbey. And there she was waiting with her back to us and the train flowing back. And we had, had the little satin handles out on the train, which we put our hands into. And then she suddenly looked round and she said, ready, girls? And mm -hmm. off we went. And it was like a medieval tapestry. Uh, the whole of the, the Westminster Abbey had been built up right up to the ceiling. There were 8,000 people in it. And then all the members of the Commonwealth, whether in their um, national dress, all the peers and peeresses were in their robes. There was quite a smell of mothballs because I think they'd all had their <laughs> robes, which actually had fur around them. Uh, and uh, it was fantastic and to have been part of that and I think probably the most moving moment of the whole coronation which she had said that the cameras have got to be turned off she agreed to the cameras being in the abbey because it was televised and filmed um, but for the anointing she said no I don't want the cameras to be there and so they turned them off and we were standing, six of us were standing just beside her. And there were some bishops and they put this canopy over her and took all the, um, ro the regalia off her, the orb and the scepter and the crown. And she was then dressed in a linen, a very simple linen sort of shift dress that was put over her coronation dress. And the, the, um, they had two people who helped her do that. And one of them was a, a sort of um, ceremonial position. It was done by the um, Marquis of Chumley. It was the most beautiful looking man. Uh, and, but I don't think he'd ever dressed himself, let alone anybody else. And when he was practicing before the coronation, he simply couldn't do up these hooks and eyes on the back of the dress. And, the Duke of Norfolk got more and more irritated. He said, can't you do it? Now I can see you can't. We'll have to put press studs, uh, poppers, press studs in on it, which, which happened. And of course, when he was doing the Queen's dress up at the back, he pressed terribly hard. And I could see her going some backs and forwards. And after it was all over, I said to her, ma'am, was that all right? And she said, no, it was not all right. Lord Chamley pressed frightfully hard. And it was rarely her. So all those little things that, of course, nobody else would have noticed, you know, that we did. And we then, after the coronation, um, she had two trains, one of them, which came up in for the ceremony in, and then we went behind the rude screen where we changed her train and then came down. And then uh, we had lunch uh, at Westminster Abbey, and no guess is what we had. We had coronation chicken. <laughs> and then she went back in the coach to go round London, and four of us went back to Buckingham Palace to receive her, which was wonderful because we saw all sorts of people like Churchill and the wonderful Queen of Tonga, who was magnificent. And she had refused to have the canopy on her coach. Uh, she kept it open so everybody could see her. And when she got back to Buckingham Palace, we were sort of standing there in our beautiful dresses. She sort of shook herself like a dog, like a Labrador, and sprayed us all with, with drops of rain. And I remember sort of backing all slightly. But she had such a marvellous smile. And then eventually the Queen came back. And uh, um, then she did say something to us she said though you know she thanked us all she said the whole day had been so wonderful um and then she took off her crown and put it on a small table and of course prince charles who was about five years old um made a beeline for it grabbed it and we thought oh my god if he drops it it will be a bad omen and my mother who was also a lady in waiting to the Queen, she'd just been made a lady in waiting, got it off him and sort of saved it. And then we, we had a, the Queen had a private film made, um, and uh, she, she was obviously so pleased it had all gone well. And she sort of skips along a corridor, and we sort of we do the same behind her. And then comes the Duke of Edinburgh and the Queen Mother looking very pleased. And behind them, Princess Margaret, looking really sad. And I remember saying to her afterwards, a day or two afterwards, oh, ma'am, I saw this film. You know, you were looking so sad. And she said, of course I'm sad. 
I lost my beloved father and my sister, really, because she's going to be so busy. Um, and, and then she said, I've got to go and live with my mother. You know, which we both laughed at that a bit. Um, and then I said, the other amazing thing that I did during coronation was come out on the balcony with the Queen. Oh, I've wow. never seen so many people. You, know, you could put a pin between them. And the actual physical thing of them shouting, and you know, it was the beginning of a new Elizabethan age. And we've been through the most horrible war, and there was still rationing, uh, you know, during the time of the coronation. And it, it was just magical. And then there was a big fly past. In those days, we had a huge air force. Uh, and it was the most magical, amazing day of my life. What an incredible experience. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yes. Oh my gosh, I'm just captivated. That's incredible. <laughs> well, and, and the thing about uh, my book and me is that I'm the only person to have written about the coronation that was actually in it. Mm. And of course, now there are very few people left. Um, you know, there are probably one or two choir boys are still alive, one or two pages. And uh, two of us sadly have died, so there are just four of us left. Um, and of course, Prince Charles. Prince so there's very, very few people that can, you know, remember the coronation. And I just feel so incredibly fortunate that I was part of it. And, yeah, and, and it had a very, very unique role in, in that as well. Um, as a lady-in-waiting, you write, the role was much like that of a mother. There was no real job description or training. So can you tell us what was life like as a lady-in-waiting? Yes, I can. I mean, I was lucky that my mother was lady in waiting to the Queen, so she was able to fill me in a bit about what what to do. I mean, uh, the the Princess Margaret and the Queen they chose friends to be um, with them because the point is that although you have a lot of official duties, you know, you're given uh, various charities which you liaise with and you organise with, and then when you travel abroad, which I love doing, and I went all over the world with Princess Margaret. You're the sort of go-between. You're the person that people can ring up or, or ask to see. And quite often they would say, no, do you know the colour of the, the dress she's wearing today? Because we want the flowers to complement it. And then one was able to tell them what she liked to eat, you know, and what she liked to drink. And then you also, um, before you went somewhere, you, you would tell where the lavatory was because if she wanted to go, one could take her there, and then one always remained outside the door, uh, preventing anybody else going in. Um, and I was always in touch with her, in eye contact, um, and at a cocktail party or something like that, or lunch, there was a list of people she would want to see, and then one went off to find them. And the thing was that one waited, if she's having a really good conversation with somebody, you waited before introducing the new person. And you could tell if she was having actually rather a boring time, well, then you went in earlier. But it was all a question of, of knowing her very well, of knowing, you know, they were always called the principal, the knowing the principal really well. And I could tell at once what she wanted. And then at, at lunches or dinners, I would sit at a table where I could see her. The disadvantage slightly of Princess Margaret was she was so small. And quite often in a cocktail party, I would lose her. Help, where is she? You know? yeah, and I had somebody she wanted to talk to. And uh, then one always sort of said, can you tell me where's Princess Margaret? And I then used to find her. But the other thing, of course, was that, I mean, she was on duty all day. It used to be quite exhausting sometimes. Um, and then in the evening, when we got back to where we were staying, you know, she'd say, well, come and have a drink with me. And we'd kick off our shoes and maybe put on our dressing gowns, uh, you know, and have a, a chat. We'd laugh and we'd discuss what we'd seen or what, you know, and all that. Um, and, you know, I mean, I, I think I say in my book, Lady in Waiting, um, the, we were staying in Sydney and uh, the, um, uh, the, the lady Cutler, who was our host, said, would Princess Margaret receive a present? So I said, well, I'm sure she'd love a present. Um, uh, you know, could, could you tell me what it is? 
And she said, well, actually, it's a boomerang cover. So, of course, I can hardly wait to get back to Princess Margaret. And I said, you'll never guess what they're going to give you. They're going to give you a boomerang cover. So Princess Margaret said, well, how do they know how big my boomerang is? I mean, we fell about laughing. Of course, it wasn't quite like that. It was a quilt that had gone out to various um, people to be sewn and, and then it had come back to Sydney. It's because it went backwards and forwards. It was called a boomerang cover. But, uh, you know, we have great fun and, uh, together. And, um, you know, uh, then when we were in England, uh, we used to have to go to the office quite often, two, three times a week, to write letters for her and that sort of thing. Um, but we, we were friends. I mean, all her ladies and waiting were friends. That's just, again, uh, your life has just had so many different layers and chapters, and all of them are incredibly fascinating. And this one is one as well. So in 1958, you and your husband began to transform the island of mystique into a paradise for the rich and famous you granted a plot of land to princess margaret who built her favorite home there and was there all the time oftentimes infamously with roddy llewellyn who you actually introduced the princess to interestingly enough when i think of mystique i think of princess margaret so for those of us like myself and Jessica, who have not had the pleasure and may never get the pleasure of visiting Mystique. Can you tell us what it's like? Help us feel like we're well, there for a day. Well, yes, that's why I wrote, actually, one of my novels is called Murder on Mystique. And I did it on purpose because so many people will never be able to go to Mystique. And although it was a, 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 it was a novel, it was a sort of murder mystery up to a point. Uh, I, I wrote about Mustique to, to tell people what it's like, and especially when we first went there. I mean, it was complete sort of Robinson Crusoe, wonderful beaches and swimming, but uh, wild cattle and uh, jungle and no water at all. We had no ele electric light or water. And when Princess Margaret came on our honeymoon uh, on the uh, Tanya, this huge ship, hove into view much bigger than the island road and uh colin and i waiting on the beach and uh, this little boat came ashore uh with very very smartly dressed um um captain and various other people in white with a letter from princess margaret saying uh, i do hope you and colin will come to dinner tonight so i wrote back and i said well we'd love to ma'am but we haven't had a bath for two months and I'm afraid we are not really very really sought out at the moment. We're all smelly. Anyway, back came a letter from her saying, oh, well, I'll put a cabin at your disposal. And I suppose it was one of the most wonderful bars I've ever had lying in the Britannia in this wonderful bar. But anyway, um, she liked the look of the island. And so Colin said to her, oh, ma'am, we haven't given you um, a wedding present. Would you like something in a little box or a piece of land? We, we get also gave it to Tony too and she said oh well I love a piece of land and it was when her marriage started to go wrong that she rang up and said um have I got a bit of land you kindly said I had but I'm not quite sure and he said we said of course you have can I come out and see it and so I said well you know I'm not sure whether it's suitable for you ma'am we've got no water um no electric light and she just said, oh, no, I don't mind a bit. I'll come. And she was wonderful. She really enjoyed it. And, um, you know, we, um, we strung up a, a bucket in a tree as a sort of shower for her. And uh, I dressed her in Colin's pyjamas because we had a lot of mosquitoes at that time and tied string around her wrists and ankles. And she, she not, wasn't at all vain, Princess Margaret, because she didn't exactly look her best. But anyway, she enjoyed it all, wreathed in smiles. And she built um, Oliver Messel, who was actually Tony's uncle, designed her house. And it was the only house she owned herself, because the one in London was a grace and favour house. And she loved it, and she loved the Caribbean, and they all called her, uh, you know, our princess. And oh, she loved dancing and picnics and swimming. We did so much swimming. And then when the house was finished, the Queen came twice to look at it. And um, Princess Margaret was so proud of it. And the Queen was so charming, looked at everything. Princess Margaret made her look at every cupboard and the lavatory and the bathroom and everything. And it was the only place that the Queen had actually uh, swum because she found she couldn't swim anywhere else in case people took a photograph of her. But being a small private island, 
we kept any of the media away. And anyway, she sw swam in a lovely bay we've got there called Macaroni. And somebody worked for Colin, took some people around two or three days later. And he came to Macaroni, he said, oh, he said, the Queen swam here three or four days ago, and we haven't changed the water since. So that was a, they thought that was quite funny. Wow. <laughs> wow. I love these stories. I could listen to you talk all day. <laughs> You oh. write that Princess Margaret taught you to stiffen your spine and get on with it. What was she like in private and what other lessons did she teach you? Princess Margaret, well, she, she was a, such a good friend to me. Uh, we got, we known each other, I was three, I think, when I first met her. And I remember she came over, Queen, Queen Mary brought her and the Queen over. Uh, as children, and uh, at the minute I saw Princess Borg and she saw me, we, we, we realised we were going to be friends. We were both quite naughty, actually. Uh, but um, she was so kind. Uh, well, I still miss her very much to this day, because I often used to ask her questions about things or ask her advice, and she gave her advice was often not what one expected. It came from a different angle. And in fact, it was very useful. And, and I, I learned a lot from her. And she had a rather difficult husband. So did I. Well, we didn't talk about them the whole time, but occasionally we, we both complained to each other. <laughs> uh, and then, of course, um, I um, had a flat in London that I bought. And, um, the people doing it up were all a long time. And I said to her, would it, I don't know where to go. I've got nowhere to go. And she said, oh, well, come to me. And I said, well, it'll only be for a fortnight because I hope it'll be finished quite soon. <laughs> In fact, I stayed with her for a whole year. Um, and so I got to know her really well. Um, and we, we just had a wonderful time together. Um, I mean, we laughed a lot. I mean, I, did, I, I think I've laughed with her more than anybody else ever. She had a great sense of humour. Mm -hmm. And she used to make one laugh on purpose when one shouldn't. Be laughing, <laughs> and then, and then I, I used to cry with laughter. And she used to say, I "Can't think why my ladies in waiting is crying because I was laughing." Actually, I, I said to her, "Please, ma'am, don't make me laugh because." <laughs> and she was. I mean, I remember uh, when we were in Australia. Um, they wanted her to go on to Bondi Beach, and she said, "No, I can't possibly. I hate sand in my shoes." So they came to me and said, "Can I? Can I?" Could I persuade her? And I said, well, leave it to me. I might be able to say, do something. And I managed to get a flat pair of her shoes from her maid. And when we were nearly there, I said to her, oh, ma'am, you know, would you change your mind? Because they really want a photograph of you on Bondi Beach. It's rather like kissing the Blarney Stone, you know. Oh, no, Anne, she said, look at my shoes. So I said, well, as it happens, I have got a pair of your flat shoes. I took them out of my bag. And she looked at me and she said, OK, Anne, you win this time. <laughs> um, but, but she then got her own back on me because the next day we went to the Sydney Zoo and they said to her, well, would you hold a ko koala bear, ma'am? We want a photograph. She said, well, actually, I'm not really good with animals. But my lady in waiting would love to hold it. <laughs> And of course, the breeches thing was weeweed all the way down my dress. So, so when we got back in the car, I said, well, you win this time, man. <laughs> I, mean, we, we, I mean, we had a good, a lovely sort of relationship. Well, you write that royal engagements have changed mightily since you were with Princess Margaret, including that royals now encounter a sea of phones rather than a sea of faces. What do you think Princess Margaret would say about life as a royal today? Well, I think she would have found it rather more difficult, possibly. I don't know. Um, I mean, the great thing about uh, she and the Queen had a wonderful relationship. I mean, you know, Princess Margaret was so loyal to her. Um, I think uh, I, she, Princess Margaret was very good at moving with the times, actually, rather better than I was. Um, and she's always interested in new things. And uh, and she was a wonderful mother, Princess Margaret. I mean, uh, David and Sarah were beautifully brought up. Uh, and she was always interested in lots of things. I mean, people were always surprised by her knowledge about things, actually. Uh, and when she stays, she, I'm sitting here now in my little farmhouse in Norfolk 
England, and uh, she came and stayed with me quite often. Uh, and it's not very big, and so she couldn't bring a maid. But she always arrived with her marigold gloves. And one of the first things, to my surprise, she said, especially the first time, can I clean your car? I said, ma'am, I'd love you to clean my car. But I thought it looked a bit dirty. Um, you know, so we used to clean it together, and she used to make the fire. She was a girl guide when she was young, which I wasn't. And she always used to do my fires, uh, that for me. And I did find her once or twice, um, sort of uh, with a feather duster, rather near some of my rather precious china. I thought, oh, goodness sake, I do hope she doesn't <laughs> knock it over. <laughs> but, and then, I mean, I, 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 some people found her a bit difficult. I never did, because I always, if, if you're having her to stay, you might as well give her a good time. And I always said, what would you like to do? Who would you like to see? You know, And she, she's very knowledgeable, I mean, on houses and churches and um, museums we used to go. She loved antique shops. We often went to the antique shop. Um, and she designed jewellery. I mean, she's all artistic, actually. Um, and, um, you know, uh, we, we had a lovely time. She had gardening. Um, she used to help me in the garden. She always said, quite rightly, she said, nothing like weeding. Uh, if you're really upset about something, go out and do some weeding and you'll feel better. <laughs> actually, quite true about that. Well, our last question for you today is the book is called Whatever Next. So what is next for you? Another book, maybe? Well, no, no I think the book was called Whatever Next. because I, When I wrote Lady in Waiting, I did um, leave quite a lot of things out of it. Or I made things perhaps more amusing than they really were. And... Uh, Partly because of uh, the Queen Consul, who's done so much uh, for, for domestic abuse. Uh, I mean, she's really brought it into the public eye. And I had a long talk with my children about it. And we just felt that I should perhaps go in a little bit more about my life, which I did. And it's had a wonderful effect, actually. I've had so many letters, wonderful, touching letters from people. And I just feel, hopefully, that I could, could with, with that this book I can help other people and there were other also stories about Princess Margaret that I would I put in and all that but I think I really may have reached the end of my authorship or what you like to call it um, because I am 90 well, I'm going to be 91 next year and it is quite exhausting actually you know when you're writing a book but one one never knows. I'm not going to say I'll never write another book. So um, I just wait and see, really. <laughs> well, writing a book is quite an accomplishment, and you have proven to be very successful at it. So um, thank you so much for your time today. And listeners, whatever next, Lessons from an Unexpected Life is already out in the UK and will hit shelves in the US on February 21st. So it is, again, wonderful to have you here today, and um, we look forward to the book. Oh, well, thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. What a delight. Thank you.